helping people cope with and overcome life's challenges. This is Life Transformations with Michael Hart, Certified Christian Counselor and Director of Ottawa's Elam Counseling Services. Hi, I'm Michael Hart, Director of Elam Counseling Service, a Christian counseling ministry in Ottawa. And I want to thank you for listening to this edition of Life Transformation, a Christian counseling radio show where chains are broken and lives are transformed. If you are not familiar with Elam Counseling, you can learn more about us at www.elamcounselingministry.com. We provide professional counseling from a Christian perspective for individuals, couples, and families. And with me in studio today is Melissa Wagot, one of our ministry assistants at Elim. And today, Melissa and I will be discussing generational curse, a popular but often misunderstood subject in Christian circles. Welcome, Melissa. It is a pleasure having you here with me today. And I am excited to have an opportunity to talk about this issue of generational curse, just to clarify some of the myths and to help people break free from the effect of past generations. Thanks so much again, Michael, for inviting me to speak with you. And I'm excited to be back on this interesting topic. So I think first things first, I know when this topic was brought to my attention, I didn't really understand what generational curse was or what it meant. So could you start just by explaining what a generational curse is? I think it's very important for us from the very get-go to understand that by curse, we mean the adverse consequences that children and future generations suffer as a result of their parents' emotional, spiritual, and psychological wounds. And I th- from what my reading into this, when people speak about generational curses, they often bring up scripture. And one of the popular scriptures that I've seen is Exodus 20, verse 5, that when God speaking to the Israelites says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of their fathers upon their children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So scriptures like this, when I read Exodus 20 verse 5, give the feeling that God is cursing children for what their parents did. So how do we reconcile such scriptures with an image of a loving God? I think it's important to understand that Uh, A loving God does not punish the children uh, for the sins of the parents. The word that is translated visiting, when God says visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children in, in Exodus 25, for example, that Hebrew word pakad could also be translated to to, to oversee or to care for. So mm-hmm. it's not that God is punishing, but God is noticing, overseeing, uh, realizes that there is going to be an effect mm. on the children. So it's not just that one generation, it's the ones that come. Right. It's, so it's more or less God, God, God seeing what is happening, saying that there is going to be an effect when parents mm. sin, it will, if, it will affect future generations. And we also have to balance that text with other texts such as Ezekiel 18, verse 1 to 3, and verses 18 to 20, where God specifically says, The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So it's important to, to, to have scripture, interpret scriptures. And this other scripture in Ezekiel is telling us that God does not punish people for other people's sin. Okay. So what would be some signs maybe then that I, as a person, am maybe experiencing this concept of a generational curse? What kind of things would I be seeing? Okay, so influence from one generation to another can be in in the form of sexual sins, for example, uh, where parents uh, indulge in certain types of of sexual behaviors. We find that oftentimes children themselves manifest those same kind of behaviors. For example, people who were abused in childhood, a lot of times they end up abusing their children as well. Uh, Other possible signs could be low self-esteem, lack of trust. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you're in in, in a uh, 
relationship in parent with with parents that you could not trust it is quite possible that in your adult relationships you will have difficulty trusting others as well we see also things like compulsive lying as a possible sign of generational curse mm-hmm. promiscuity addictions are also mm-hmm. a, a very common uh, a possible sign of generational curse infidelity and and so on and so forth so these signs sort of seem far reaching so i guess the concept of maybe if you had a parent that was had alcoholism mm-hmm. you being a bit more prone to that kind of thing absolutely absolutely uh children uh and there there are psychological reasons for this there are two, basically two psychological uh factors that is stated as being how that explains how sin passes from one generation to another uh one theory is what they call the attachment theory which states that humans have an innate need to form close bonds with other human beings and that if a child is mistreated they begin to think the world is a hostile place and that interferes with their relationships with other individuals mm. so if if one generation is mistreated and they're not given the love and the and and, and the, the, the and do not bond with their parents then that child goes forward in into into their adult lives, not knowing how to give that love mm-hmm. and, and that closeness to their children. And so it passes from one generation to another. Another uh, explanation is a theory that they call, that is called by psychologists, social learning theory. And what this says is that uh, children observe and that they learn uh, by observing the world around them. So mm-hmm. as they see their parents act, as they see that, for example, trust is violated uh, in the relationship with their parents, they learn from that and then they go on and repeat the same kind of behaviors later on in life. Ah, okay. That's starting to clarify things a little bit more for me in terms of what it looks like and what it is and how it relates back to some biblical perspectives for me. Mm-hmm. Is there any more scientific research that shows how parents' attitudes and behaviors influence their children? All right, there are, there are new research on what they call epigenetics. And the, the word epigenetics actually mean on top of or outside of the gene. And what this suggests is that our lifestyle can modify gene expression and that this modification can be passed on to future generations. So, for example, if a person makes good lifestyle choices, there is a change that takes place, not, not to the DNA code, but outside of the genes at, at, that can be passed on to other generations. Other research, uh, such as a study that was done in 2011 by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, found that the, the odds of a teenager getting drunk repeatedly is twice as great if they have seen their parents under the influence of alcohol or drug use, even if it happened only once. So th- these f- findings are very profound. So it shows that parents' behavior do have an impact on the children. And there is another uh, a study that that I find very interesting as well. And it was this study was published in the American Journal of Public Health. And it states that if a, the teenage girls are less likely to be sexually active if parents were married at the time of their birth. So I think this is just profound when you see scientific study bearing out what the Bible says, that the sin of one generation can be passed on uh, to, to other generations. And I think it reinforces that point you spoke of before, how children are watching mm-hmm. and learning from the examples around them and how the behaviors of a parent, both from what they've learned and what they're demonstrating to their own kids, can just be so impactful for generations to come. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we, we, we see that the, the Bible uh, is right when it says that the, the the, the parents, when, when the parents do something, that it actually affects the children. But as I, I repeat, that it's not that God is placing a curse on future generations. It's that God observes or oversees that this influence 
is taking place. So if you're just joining us today, you're listening to Life Transformations, a Christian counseling radio show by Elam Counseling Service. And I am your host, Michael Hart, Director of Elam Counseling Service. You can find out more about us at our website at www.elamcounselingministry.com. And with me in studio today is Melissa Wagot, and we are discussing generational curse. So far, we have laid the foundation that uh, generational uh, curse or influence from one generation to the next is a reality, but that God does not curse future generations for the sin of their the sin of their parents. But however, their scientific research that we have looked at so far in this show have shown that yes, there is this influence that is passed on from one generation to the next. And so, so far, Michael, you've given some examples of that passed on effect with the young ladies being more sexually promiscuous and things like that, um, different addiction issues and things. Are there biblical examples of sins that have been passed on from parents to the children? I'm so glad you asked that question, Melissa, because I think it's important for us to be able to back up what we are talking about with just not uh, psychological research, but to be able to see from Scripture that there are examples of that. One example is found in Genesis 12, verse 14 to 20. And it, it's a story of Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham travels to Egypt to escape the drought and tells Sarah to lie to Pharaoh because she was beautiful and he was afraid that he would be killed. So Sarah agrees to lies, but Pharaoh finds out the, the truth in a dream and and was very was was fearful that God would punish him because of the sin that he was about to commit with Sarah. So we we see that Abraham does the same thing again later on. But what is even more interesting is that his son Isaac and all and his, to, told his wife Rebecca to to lie to to Abimelech to, to King Abimelech as well. And this is found in Genesis twenty six verse seven. So we see that Abraham the father uh, told this lie, told his wife to lie. We see in the next generation that his son Isaac is telling his wife Rebecca to lie. But but. Even more in- interesting is that we, we see also later on that Rebecca tells, teaches her son to lie and that there is a, a family feud that develops between Isaac and develops b- between the brothers as a result of the, the mother teaching sons to lie. So now we have going to the fourth generation. Now Jacob's son lied to Jacob about Joseph being killed by an animal when he was sold into slavery. So it's interesting. We see this thread of lying mm. passing on from one generation to the next. So we have four generations in what I have just laid out there. And we, we see also that in the show that we had with Leon Chartron, when he talked about the, the, the work that we did in session where we did the generational, the genogram as we call it, which mm-hmm. is a generational tree that look at addictions in family, mental health issues in family and so forth, that Leon was able to see very clearly that there was a, there was a thread of... Uh, maladaptive behavior and addictions and that that run through his family as well. Okay. So you actually did a Kingdom Life seminar about common gateways into which people enter into these generational curses and the way they seem to be transferred from one generation to the next. Could you explain the difference between the signs that we referred to earlier about things like lying, addiction, anxiety that are often seen with generational curses and the gateways? Okay, so let me just uh, say that the, the signs that we look at are like the manifestation of the, of the generational curse, but the gateways are what led, what are some, what, what led to that sign being manifested. So what we find when we we study parents' behavior, we see that there are there are seven major gateways that 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 opens up seven major gateways that leads to 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 a curse being passed on from one generation to another. So one common gateway is is sexual 
perversion. So if there is sexual perversion in a family where there are things like incest, mm -hmm. uh, sexual abuse, or promiscuity, it's as if it opens a gateway in future generations where the children themselves will manifest a lot of dysfunction, not just sexual dysfunction, but there will be a lot of, uh, 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 of dysfunction that will occur in, in, in subsequent generations as well. Another common gateway that is brought out by the attachment theory is emotional neglect. Mm. So when there is emotional neglect by, by absent parents or, for example, emotionally absent parents can be parents who suffer from things like depression and are not not uh, present to show love and attention to a child because of the mental struggles that they're having, we find that this can in turn be passed on very easily. So this opens up a gateway to, to future generations. Another very common gateway, Melissa, is physical abuse. Mm. And I think this speaks for itself. So like if someone is physically abused, they're psych it, it does a lot of, of psychological harm uh, to that person. And then there is this tendency for that physical abuse to have a lot of negative effects, but also to be repeat, reputed, repeated sorry, mm -hmm. in future generations. Uh, the others, go, uh, and I'll go over these very quickly, not just physical abuse, but psychological abuse, uh, spiritual deception mm. yeah, also runs in family. So we find especially uh, people who study effect, the effect of uh, spirituality such as voodoo or witchcraft or or Satanism, we find that that opens up a gateway uh, of evil in generations that 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 perpetuates itself from one generation to the next. And then another common uh, gateway that we see is broken relationships. Mm. Uh, we, we know from research that broken relationships such as divorce, frequent relocations, uh, uh, children who are given up for adoption, there are, there are a lot of uh, negative, negative effects that flows as, flows as a result of these kind of bro these kind of broken relationships, and then the final one that I'll, I'll I'll go over very quickly is what we call maladaptive modeling. So things such as lying, antisocial behavior, and compulsive behaviors are another common gateway where we see that the influence is passed from one generation. To the next. So, if you're just joining us uh, today, this is your host, Michael Hart of Elim Counseling Ministry, and with me in studio today is Melissa Wagat, and we are discussing generational curse. And so far, we have said that generational curse could be uh, better defined as generational influence because God does not curse a generation for the sins of of previous generation, but in fact, the word that that is translated uh, God visiting the sins of the parents upon the children could also be translated that God is overseeing or observing that the sins of the parents affect children. We also said that there is scientific research that shows that their sins do pass or tendencies do pass from one generation to the next. And we are just in the process of looking at uh, seven common gateways of our generational curse is passed on from one generation to the next. And uh, so we have just finished discussing that. So Melissa, uh, over back to you. So I know one of our goals of this radio show and your ministry, Michael, is to give hope to people. Um, when they find themselves in these type of situations. So if someone is listening today and they believe that there's a generational curse at work on their own life, what are some of the steps necessary for them to break that curse? Are they trapped? Well, I think it, it's it, there is hope because we, we know that through the work that we do, that we have seen people who have come in, uh, such as Leon, who shared his testimony uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, where these cur these, these curse or these influences can be broken, but there there are specific things that needs to need to be done before the curse can be broken or before this influence can be be stopped from passing on to future generations. I think the very first step, Melissa, is that 
uh, people need to become aware, mm. become aware that these curse or these influence or these negative tendencies exist. Because sometimes people go about their lives oblivious that they're living under the influence of a curse. So one of the best things that a person can do is to sit down and to begin to talk about, okay, what are what are my tendencies that I dislike? Or do I see these tendencies in my parents? Do I see these tendencies in my grandparents? And I believe that in itself can be very empowering. It can be like a wake-up call Mm -hmm. where people go, yes, I see this, that there is this tendency, and I want to do something about it. So the very first step is to become aware of the curse. The second step would be to address behaviors that, that perpetuate the curse. So if a person is acting in negative ways and they are, for example, using alcohol or drug to mask the pain instead of dealing with the pain, then that is just perpetuating the curse. If people are hiding, sometimes we find that people hide behind their spirituality Mm. instead of facing that, you know what, I have these tendencies and I need to do something about it. Then the the tendency is for the, the curse to be perpetuated. So I have maybe four or five here that I, I, I need to go to. So I don't know if you have any, any comments no, or questions. No, keep going. This is great. Okay, good. So an, another thing that I, another step that I find is very critical to, to break in generational curse is that uh, it's important to identify defense mechanisms that prevent us from facing the pain. And one very common defense mechanism that we we know exists is what we all know about is denial, mm. right? You have often heard it said, Melissa, that a person is in denial. You know, they they are not facing up to the reality. Exactly, exactly. So it, it's important to be aware of defense mechanisms like this because sometimes the pain is so deep, and the hurt the hurt is so profound, and that it. People don't want to face that reality and they pretend as if it, it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. I had a sad, uh, this, 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 a sad thing uh, that uh, happened, uh, came, to, came to light uh, uh, in a session that I had some years ago where this young lady told me that she went to her mother and she said, I am being abused by my father, mm-hmm. sexually abused by my father. And the mother's reaction is, no, that, that is not happening. Mm-hmm. That could not be happening. This is, this is not happening. Don't make up stories. Yeah. So huge denial right there. Huge denials because that mother was not ready to face the fact that there were there are tough decisions that would now have to be mm-hmm. made but as if she accepted the fact that this was happening in her household. So the, the next step is to begin to to change your your mental focus from the curse to blessings. Begin to meditate. Psalm 1 verse 1 to 4 said, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law does he meditate day and night. So we find that as people begin to meditate on more positive things that the the curse begins to lift and Mm -hmm. their mindsets begins to be changed from one of negativity to one of hope and peace and joy. So when Psalm tells us that we need, Psalm 1 tells us that we need to meditate on the law of the Lord, this could be a way of refuting lies that have been told in, in future generations. Maybe a person's mother may have told them or father may have said, you are no good or you will never account to a, amount to anything in life. But what does the Word of God say? The Word of God says we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. So that's a way of beginning to refute negative uh, things that were seeds that were sowed in, in past generation. Then I find that it... it Sometimes the, 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 uh, an important step is to get medical help mm-hmm. because there are times when these, these uh, tendencies or influence are so deep-rooted that despite trying over and over and over, a person is not able to, to break 
from the curse. So, so get professional help. And then finally, there is a, a, a prayer of renouncing curse that it can also be very effective spiritually, mm -hmm. uh, praying and saying, God, I, I release myself from whatever bondage I may, be, I may be under from the sins of my parents. I find that can be, be very helpful if it is done in, in line with the other things as well. So we are coming up to the end of the show today. Time has gone by very quickly. It's hard to it's hard to believe that uh, you know we are almost at the end of the the show today. And Melissa, I want to thank you very much for joining me in studio today and for your very thoughtful questions. It was great being here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much. If you're listening to today's show and you, you are struggling to break free from patterns of behavior, you have noticed in your parents or grandparents, the good news is you can be set free by following some of the steps that we have talked about in this show. And this may include getting professional help as well. Uh, if you're in need of professional help, you, or, for, or if you're in need of, f of further information, you can call us at 613-699-1677. Again, 613-699-1677. Or you can go to our website at www.elimcounseling.com ministry.com. I want to remind you also that in February, starting February 13th, we have a three-week seminar called the Good Grief Seminar uh, that will be running for, for three weeks starting the, set, the, the 13th at Community Pentecostal Church. And uh, you can call the, the numbers I have mentioned so far, 613-699-1677, to get more information if you're struggling with grief and you would like to, to get uh, professional help. Uh, until next time, this is your host, Michael Hart of Elim Counseling Service, praying that God would grant you happiness in all your relationships and keep you sound in mind and pure in heart. God bless you and take care until next time. <music>